Hello, everyone. Um, we're going to get started now. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. And welcome to the Joint Syrian Studies Association and Society for Armenian Studies panel uh, titled Heritage and Periled, Wartime Destruction of Antiquities from Syria to Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh. My name is Elise Samarjan, and I am the president of the Syrian Studies Association. And today we've partnered with the Society for Armenian Studies to create our first ever webinar event on a topic that preoccupies both of our memberships and beyond. The panel was conceived in light of 10 years of horrific violence in Syria that has brought to the surface the relationship between the intentional destruction of heritage and human rights. From the destruction of the ancient Greco-Roman heritage at Palmyra and the execution of Syrian archeologist and heritage defender Khaled Lassad by the Islamic State, the world has watched in horror as Syria and Iraq's precious heritage was either destroyed or sold in the black market or destroyed by indiscriminate bombings by foreign occupiers and regimes. And how did human rights and international organizations respond to the, cultural, the destruction of cultural heritage in Syria? And what lessons can heritage activism in Syria offer scholars and activists mobilizing to protect Armenian ant antiquities that are endangered from yet another war that erupted in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh last fall. The intentional destruction of heritage was a criterion of genocide that human rights lawyer Raphael Lemkin, the man who coined the word genocide, considered including in his definition, but did not ultimately include in the final draft of the UN Convention for the Prevention of Genocide in 1948. Our panel is comprised of scholars who also out of necessity have a hand in activism to preserve endangered heritage temporally and spatially um, that is, exists temporally and spatially within foreign Ottoman lands and caucuses. It's also quite fitting that our panel this morning will be moderated by an historian of Syria who also works on the heritage of both Muslims and Armenians, Hagna Watanpa. She's also a Syrian Studies Association board member and we're thankful for all of our panelists who've joined us today to offer us their perspectives. I'm going to now hand things off to Bedros Dermatosian, the president of the Society for Armenian Studies, who will introduce our moderator. Thank you very much, Elise. Uh, thank you also for the Syrian Studies Association. As far as I know, this is the first cooperation between the two uh, societies' associations uh, dealing with a the common theme experienced by both countries, I should say, which is cultural heritage, destruction, so uh, the, the cultural heritage destruction is not endemic to one society. It's a global phenomenon and we should consider it as such and compare and contrast between the experiences of different societies in general. Before I introduce our moderator, I just want to uh, speak on behalf of the Society of Armenian Studies regarding our uh, three years strategic plan uh, during the 46th annual membership meeting held on January 21, 2021, the society mapped a three-year strategic plan which will concentrate on three areas. First, strengthening ties, SAS ties with education institutions in Armenia and Artsakh. Second, mentoring SAS graduate students. And third, disseminating knowledge about Armenian studies throughout the world. We decided to prioritize the strengthening of mutual cooperation between SAS and academic institutions in Artsakh and Armenia and SAS will use academic means as such to expound the importance of preserving Artsakh cultural heritage and expose attempts to distort the history of Artsakh in general and reaffirm the undeniable right of its population to live in freedom, harmony, and independence. And we are, uh, we are, oh, we are, we are witnessing today the distortion or distorting of historical facts and on the ground. So, our distinguished moderator is Herinar Zeitlan Watumpo. She's a professor of history, art history at the University of California, Davis. She specializes in art and architecture of the Middle East. Her first book on architecture of Ottoman Aleppo received a book award from the Society of Architectural Historians. Her second book, The Missing Pages, published by Stanford University Press, received book prizes from the Society for Armenian Studies and the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association. 
the gold medal in world history from the Independent Publisher Books Awards, and it was shortlisted for the William Saroyan International Prize for writing in the category of nonfiction. Professor Wotumpo was recently named a fellow of the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar. Professor Wotumpo has conducted extensive field research in Syria, Turkey, and Armenia. And she's also a board member of the Syrian Studies Association, as well as an uh, active member in the Society for Armenian Studies. Floor is yours, uh, Hermer. Thank you so much, Petros, and thank you, the Society for Armenian Studies and Syrian Studies Association um, for uh, making possible this collaboration. We have, uh, these two organizations have many things in common, including our initials. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm glad that we're able uh, to work together. Um, before I introduce our um, distinguished panelists, I uh, just want to recall our, our colleagues um, who are not here because they have been destroyed along with the cultural heritage that they cared about. So I want to invoke the memory of Dr. Khaled Al-Assad, the archaeologist um, and teacher in Palmyra. Uh, who was murdered by ISIS. And I also want to invoke the memory of Professor Vahram Lalayan, who was a professor of medieval history and theology um, at uh, the University of Artsakh. Uh, he was murdered in his home next to his library. Um, another point I want to make very briefly is that part, part of what we um, want to pay attention to is the responses of artists and creative voices um, to the destruction of culture. So I want to read very briefly a translated excerpt from a poem by Saleh Baddiyadi. Uh, quote, the people of the new millennium are determined to reduce their ruins to the dust of ruins. Palmyra collapses on its own rubble. Petra will follow along with Nineveh and Nippur. Alexandria and Heliopolis blindfolded await their turn to return to dust. Unquote. As scholars, uh, as teachers, and as activists in cultural heritage, um, we have a lot to do to counter, prevent the destruction of cultural heritage and to counter its harmful effects. And I am uh, so very much looking forward to hearing from all of you today. So what I'll do now is I'm going to introduce the speakers in the order in which they appear on our flyer. Um, and then I will give the floor to them. To, they're going to speak for a few minutes and then we will go to the Q&A. Our first speaker is Professor Christina Maranci. She is the Arthur H. Dadian and Ara Ustemel Chair of Armenian Art and Architectural History at Tufts University. And she's also the chair of that department. She is the author of three books and over 90 articles and essays on medieval Armenian art and architecture, including most recently an introduction to Armenian art, Oxford University Press. Her previous monograph, Vigilant Powers, on the 7th century architecture of Armenia, won both the Sona Aronian Prize for Best Armenian Studies monograph from the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, and also the Karen Gold Prize for Art History from the Medieval Academy of America. Professor Maranci has worked on issues of cultural heritage for over a decade. Her campaign for the Cathedral of Meren near Ani in present-day Turkey resulted in the inclusion of this site on the World Monuments Watch List for 2015 to 17. Our next spe speaker will be Dr. Ani Avakian. Uh, Dr. Avakian is the director of the Rosham Regional Center for Cultural Heritage Management, Enhancement and Protection. And she's also the chair of the International Council of Museums National Committee of Armenia. Dr. Avakian obtained her degree from the Armenian State Pedagogical University in 2005. She has conducted research on the Armenian monuments in India. She has worked at the National Gallery of Armenia in a number of different capacities, and she established the education department there. Her work with the International Council of Museums also includes working as the secretary of the International Committee for Education and Cultural Action. 
She has initiated and organized a number of professional development courses, national, regional, or international trainings, workshops, and conferences. She organized most notably Museum Week 2018 in Yerevan. She has published widely in the field of art history and museum studies. Uh, the next speaker, Professor Stephanie Mulder, is Associate Professor of Islamic Art and Architecture at the University of Texas at Austin. She's a specialist in Islamic art, architectural history, and she's an archaeologist. She worked for over 10 years as the head ceramicist at Balis, the medieval Islamic city in Syria, and she has also conducted archeological and art historical field work in Syria, Egypt, Turkey, in addition to a number of other countries, including the United States. Professor Mulder's book, The Shrines of the Halids in Medieval Syria, Sunnis, Shi'is, and the Architecture of Coexistence, published by Edinburgh University Press in 2014, is the recipient of the Hamilton Book Award Grand Prize, the Syrian Studies Association Award, and Iran's World Prize for Book of the Year. The book was also selected as an ALA Choice Magazine Outstanding Academic Title. In addition to her many scholarly publications, Professor Mulder has appeared in media interviews and written editorials for outlets such as the BBC, Al Jazeera, the LA Times, Huffington Post, among many other uh, venues, um, on cultural heritage issues, Islamic art, antiquities, and the history of sectarian relations in Islam. In her work for the conservation of antiquities and cultural heritage sites endangered by war and illegal trafficking, Professor Mulder is a consultant for the Saving the Heritage of Syria and Iraq initiative, supported by the Penn Cultural Heritage Center, the Smithsonian Institute, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And she's on the board of directors for the Syrian Heritage Initiative of the American Schools of Oriental Research, sponsored by the US State Department. Professor Mulder is also a board member of the Syrian Studies Association. Um, and finally, uh, Dr. Salam al Quntar is lecturing assistant professor of archaeology at Rutgers's Department of Classics and assistant dean of Middle Eastern Affairs at Rutgers Global. Professor al Quntar has worked at the Directorate General of Antiquities and Museums in Syria in a number of different capacities from 96 until 2012. Since 2012, she has been active in the field of cultural heritage preservation. Professor al Quntar is a National Geographic explorer, a consulting scholar at the Penn Museum, and the chair of CMAT, Syrians for Heritage, a nonprofit association for heritage preservation based in Berlin. Her research interests center on the archaeology and heritage of the Middle East, exploring a wide variety of themes such as ancient economy and urbanism forced migration, modern identity, and historic narratives, conflict, and iconoclasm. Um, now I will uh, give the floor over to Professor Christina Maranci. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Hegnar. I'm going to share my screen. And I, I want to also thank the Syrian Studies Association and the Society of Armenian Studies, um, you, Hechnar, at least for organizing this. Um, what I want to offer in the next few minutes is a sense of the scope of the threat to Armenian monuments in Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, and giving some examples and then look at some examples of destruction um, by the Azerbaijani government um, in, in Artsakh, but also in Julfa, and then engage with my esteemed colleagues about, about comparator, comparative evidence from Syria and Turkey, and talk about together what, what, we, what we've learned from, um, from the past and what, how we might use that knowledge into the future. So um, I'm gonna try to keep to seven, seven slash eight minutes. Um, so as, as you well know, on November 9th, uh, Russia, Armenia and Azerbaijan signed a ceasefire agreement 
in which several uh, ethnically Armenian provinces were handed over to Azerbaijan, leaving thousands of monuments and artifacts uh, exposed and in danger. So I just have a map up here for you of Artsakh, um, as well as a detail of a really striking image of a breastfeeding mother and child in, in, on a Khachkar or carved cross stone in the northern province of Karvajar in a monastery called Handapert, which is now under Azeri control, to give you a sense of the big picture, but also the fine grained picture of what kinds of artifacts are, are in danger now. Um, so in fact, when we talk about the thousands of monuments uh, that are now under Azeri control, we're talking about a range of kinds of monuments um, from Christian to Islamic, from uh, ecclesiastical to civic. And um, this, this incredible range also dates from the earliest periods um, of Christianity uh, into the modern period, into the 20th century. So it's a tremendous diversity of uh, monuments that is um, now under threat. And uh, in the media for the, since um, uh, the ceasefire agreement, there has been discussion of several of the most important monuments that are now um, have been surrendered. Uh, and I'm listing some of those here. And so we've, we've heard a lot about some of these. There are many though. And in the Karvajar district alone, which is in the Northeast of, um, of the relevant region uh, or Northwest rather, um, this, is a, this is a map of the province, but we're talking about this many monuments, um, churches, monasteries, khachkars, fortresses. So the extent of potential damage is very great. Um, the, the beautiful um, image of the breastfeeding mother and child belongs, as I said, to a clutch card that is located in this region of Karvajar. And um, I've written about this clutch card recently, but it's been studied very well um, by the, the RAA or Research on Armenian Architecture. And I'm just showing you a slide of it there, but this is just one of many, many clutch cars that are now in danger. So the status of this Khachkar right now, I do not know. Um, but it is supremely important, not just as a trace of an Armenian community, but for what it tells us about art history, what it tells us about theology, uh, what it tells us about patronage, what it tells us about visual representations of women and children. So again, the, the, we're not just talking about numbers and we're not just talking about categories of architecture, we're talking about whole worlds of learning and knowledge that are now um, in, at, at, in danger. Uh, the same can be said of the region just uh, to the south called Kashatar. Uh, this map should give you a sense of the Armenian monuments that are um, have now been surrendered. Again, a massive number that have been studied and they've been studied since the 19th century, uh, but less so than the monuments of greater Armenia. So that's another piece that there hasn't been the kind of dense, um, long sustained scholarship uh, that we've seen in places like Ani, for example. Uh, so, so the loss is also particularly worrying because we don't have that, those, um, that kind of density of archives associated with the monuments. Um, in Kashatach, we have uh, this unusual early Christian basilica, um, which is called Tsitsernavank and is again now part of the territory surrendered. It is a, in some ways, a basilica that recalls uh, those farther to the north, as in Ashtarak Tsiranavor, um, but it is distinctive in having a gallery above the Eastern apse, which is something that is quite unusual that has been remarked upon in the scholarship. So these kinds of interesting elements, um, which could help us explore and, and, and further get a sense of the richness of Armenian architecture are again, part of 
what could become a casualty. So it's not just, again, the monuments as objects or the monuments as material presences, but it's a whole, a whole line of inquiry that is um, a concern right now. Um, moving around the, the, in the provinces that have been surrendered, Amaras is another important example. Um, Amaras is a monastery that is associated with the earliest um, Christian presence in Armenia with a tomb that dates back at least to the fifth century. Um, so again, important in its own right and important in comparison with Armenian uh, monuments farther to the north. What kinds of destruction um, can we expect? Um, well, we have precedents. So there is the example uh, from uh, Karvajar province itself. In the 1950s, a school was constructed of the tombstones of Ar Armenian, uh, from Armenian cemeteries. And so what you're looking at here, again, from the researches on Armenian architecture is a plan of this school built in the 1950s, constructed of Armenian tombstones, fragmentary inscriptions, and building materials. So this is one way in which destruction happens, has happened in the region. And that is by essentially the destruction and reuse of building materials. There is also, of course, the well-known documented uh, state-sponsored Azeri destruction of the cemetery at Julfa, which if, as we well know, um, thanks to Simon Marakian has been, um, was uh, a sustained project over many years and which of course was caught on video. So complete erasure is another um, possibility. And so too is the destruction and effacement or continued destruction and effacement of Armenian inscriptions. And this um, of course is connected to the claim that the Azeris are making about the Caucasian Albanian identity of the uh, Armenian monuments. So um, this is something that we can see, for example, in social media put out by Azerbaijan that um, monuments uh, are monuments, these Christian monuments are not in fact Armenian, but Caucasian Albanian. So that's another dimension, in fact, of the destruction, what is sometimes called art washing or the deliberate, um, deliberate misinterpretation of monuments um, and essentially the de harmonization of them. Um, there have been already in the war, as we know, documented examples of destruction, the Gazanchet Tzotz Cathedral, and then here the Kanach Jam Church in Shushi, both in Shushi. So the damage has begun. Uh, and the extent of the damage to this day um, is, is unclear. Uh, that's the question of monitoring needs to be discussed and, and is, is being discussed and is being um, looked at carefully by various groups. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, so that's, so what I've tried to give is just a sense of the, 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 the stakes of, um, of the destruction of potential destruction of Armenian monuments, what we could lose and the precedents for destruction. What kinds of, um, what, what ways, what are the ways in which Armenian mon monuments have already suffered violence now turning to Turkey, just really briefly, um, we have seen ways in which groups, heritage groups have been working on Armenian monuments and doing constructive work. And I'm just showing you the example of the Church of the Savior at Ani and um, a little bit of the World Monuments Fund um, interventions there. Um, so that's something that we can discuss maybe. Um, and just another example from World Monuments Fund, this is a, the risk assessment matrix made of monuments in Ani and in the region of Ani. Um, so again, World Monuments Fund uh, sponsored this project that tried to assess um, and, and rank the monuments in, the, in Ani and in the region by historical significance, architectural significance, and also condition. These are ways in which in Turkey, we have seen um, steps towards uh, the um, 
working together to stabilize monuments. And also in Turkey, um, as Heknar mentioned, I had worked on the Cathedral of Meren. And one thing that we were able to achieve there is uh, the laser scanning of the whole site, which um, although we didn't and we haven't yet done any work to stabilize the monument, uh, at least this is going some way towards, um, towards a, um, a preservation, if you will, of the site, but hopefully there'll be more, um, more to come, more physical interventions to come. So um, the Armenian monuments in Artsakh are obviously at risk. Um, they, they are, this risk is, is, has multifaceted. It's not just about, you know, losing these material presences, but everything that's connected to those, to those um, presences, the, they are sacred, the historical presence of Armenians in the region. Um, so the, the, the damage, um, the potential damage is, is very great. So I think just some questions that I have that maybe we can bring up during the, during the discussion is how do we communicate this to the people that can, can make change, can affect change? What should be the role of, of scholars and educators and then finally, and in here I'm, I'm, I'm directing my question to my esteemed colleagues, what are, the, what are the lessons that we can learn from Syria and Turkey? So I think with that, I'm gonna stop share and just um, pass the baton on to my colleagues. Thank you so much, Christina. Ani, uh, Dr. Avakian, you have the floor. Thank you, Hernar, for passing me the floor. Um, and I'd like to thank also the Society for Armenian Studies and Syrian Studies Association for inviting me to this um, important discussion. And I'm really convinced that as much we speak, we talk, we may have more possibility to um, sort of bring our uh, input in the protection of the cultural heritage. So I will directly go to my presentation. Uh, I'm going to focus mostly on, on the effect on the museums that we have lost during the recent war with, uh, for the Nagorno-Karabakh that took place between September, November of 2020. And uh, out of 22 museums um, operating in different parts of Artsakh, uh, we have lost 12 of them. Uh, by the way, regardless the um, status, whether those are state, private, or uh, just the existing collections. We have monitored within ICOM Armenia the old collections. And I have to say that unfortunately, uh, the number, the exact number of uh, collections lost is not clear because um, uh, the authorities are trying to monitor and to understand. But by now we can say that almost 20,000 pieces of culture arts uh, and movable cultural heritage are lost uh, uh, on the territories occupied by Azerbaijan. So here you can see the list of the museums that were located on the territory of Shushi, basically the cultural center of, of Artsakh. And uh, unfortunately, due to its um, location, it was not believed by anybody that Shushi would be lost. So uh, only uh, the collection from one museum, the Carpet Museum, partially was evacuated. Now, talk about this a little bit later. Here you see the uh, slide about the State Museum of uh, Fine Arts that was established in 2013 and showcased uh, about uh, six, more than 600 art pieces coming from different parts of the world. And um, all collection is still there in Shushi, hopefully is still there. Uh, State Museum of Geology after Grigory Gabrielians, uh, a person who donated his personal private collection um, to establish this museum with a precious collection of minerals and 
stones again coming from the region and different parts of the world. I have been there in 2018 and I can say that the collection is really an extraordinary one. Here you see the photos from the carpet museum and you know that carpet is became a political uh, topic of negotiations um, and, and Artsakh is uh, owner of old traditions of different types of um, carpets that were invented and developed um, in, on the territory of historical Artsakh. Uh, I'd just like to tell you that um, the director of the museum could evacuate on the 1st of September um, a part of the collection. And on the 20th of February, just a week ago in Yerevan, in the Museum of Museum Institute of Architecture after Alexander Tamanyan, they have opened a beautiful uh, exhibition of the saved carpets and the uh, uh, exhibition will still be there at least for three months. Those who will be in Yerevan, I would recommend to visit and to see uh, the collection. Um, these are the two facts of the first deliberate targeting of cultural sites. Uh, the um, first uh, photo you can see is from the cultural house of Shushi. And uh, further on, our investigations on the social media showed that uh, Azerbaijanis uh, on the state official level were being praised uh, about um, uh, bombing and destruction of the culture of house because the current president was inaugurated in this building. Now also just pay attention on the values and on the arguments that are being reason to destroy cultural sites. <laughs> The other photo you see here is the Khazan Chetsot's church uh, that is a symbol of Artsakh and Shushi was targeted twice in a day. Here are some photos of uh, museum building after the, um, after the destruction. Actually, we are talking a lot about Shushi museums, but we have lost really important and valuable collections in Hadrut city and uh, in the villages around. Here you see the list. And I would like particularly to underline the National Hadrut Museum of Homeland uh, Studies after Artur Mukherjian, that used to be the first president of Artsakh uh, Republic. Um, uh, and we have seen a video uh, showcased by uh, as a very soldier um, inside, um, inside the uh, storage rooms, uh, and we saw that it's totally in a mess. Though we have no information about the status, current status of these collections there, but we have really serious warnings about the fate uh, after seeing also this. Uh, so the cultural uh, heritage under Azeri occupation is facing, may face illicit trafficking, Albanification as also Christina has mentioned already and is going to be a really very important issue to look after. Cultural destruction is definitely, we have a very uh, clear example, not uh, very far ago in the history, ethnic cleansings and uh, actually uh, the cultural heritage is, under danger and cultural genocide may take place and it is taking place, we are witnessing nowadays. So we strongly recommend making the issue of protection and transfer of the collections to the people of Artsakh and uh, inseparable part uh, of the diplomatic negotiations. This should be uh, particularly very importantly underlined. Uh, then the collections of, um, um, of some museums uh, could be exposed to illicit trafficking and Interpol and other international institutions should look closely to this issue. Uh, during the months we are witnessing uh, videos, comments and posts on social media about um, uh, taking revenge from the Armenian historical um, cultural sites, particularly those which have Armenian inscriptions or cross stones are facing really serious damages. 
Um, and of course, constant propaganda of uh, Caucasian Albanification of Armenian cultural heritage is uh, taking very actively um, uh, as, as, as a state on the, on the state policy of Azerbaijan. Uh, even the calls, I can say that during the war, many international institutions dealing with cultural heritage and not only raised their voice and demanded to protect the cultural heritage and safeguard. Uh, but uh, we witnessed after the ceasefire, even after the 10th of November, still the process is ongoing till now. So here you can see a few um, photos showcasing the vandalism acts against Armenian cultural heritage on the occupied territories. And uh, last but not least, I'm really convinced that humans should make peace and particularly uh, those working for cultural heritage should advocate for the protection of cultural heritage, regardless its location or origin. Thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer your questions during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Avakian. Um, Professor Stephanie Mulder, you have the floor. I think that um, if it's okay with you guys, we might switch it up and have Salam go first. Is that okay? Sure. Salam, would you like to go first? All right. All right, let me see, share my screen. Okay, thank you for having me in this panel. Uh, today I will talk uh, briefly about the destruction of heritage in Syria during the, the uh, last 10 years and uh, some of the responses to that uh, destruction that has been uh, on a massive scale. So Syrian cultural heritage, uh, as you know, Syria is a host to six world heritage sites. Uh, about 10 tentative World Heritage Sites. And almost all the six heritage sites, World Heritage Sites got, uh, you know, damaged one way or another. Um, the destruction is unprecedented and it happened in different forms. Um, collateral damage, that is the most, uh, most of the destruction happened during that way, if we're talking, you know, quantitative da data bombing, uh, and this is mostly done by organized armies, uh, the Syrian regime army, uh, uh, more recently uh, Turkish and uh, Russian also uh, air jets. Uh, other times of like uh, collateral damage or for military purpose. So these are targeting sites, not for their cultural value, but because they are for strategic military uh, action. So this is done by the rebels in Aleppo during the siege of Aleppo, uh, and th they just bombed tunnels. Um, uh, now intentional damage, uh, that is another uh, way that being done. Um, here we have like uh, Syrian and Iranian uh, backed mil uh, Shia militias destroying Sunni uh, monuments. Uh, targeting the minaret of the Umayyad mosque in Aleppo. Uh, looting also another, or let me go to the other slide actually before. Uh, ISIS is the most notorious uh, 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 party that did the intentional damage or uh, uh, destruction. Um, and this is the picture from a Muslim museum, but and that one from Palmyra. Uh, but they equally did the same thing at the Palmyra Museum as well. And uh, there's no time to show you all the damage they did in Palmyra, which they basically completely, uh, you know, destroyed uh, most of the monuments. Um, go back. Looting is a huge problem um, all over Syria. Um, and this is uh, Apamea, one of the very important Hellenistic sites in Syria being looted in that way. 
Now, what has been the response to the destruction? Uh, first of all, at the beginning, when uh, sites being damaged, uh, social media groups uh, initiated by archaeologists uh, started to, uh, you know, appear, and these formed some kind of organizations, so like the Syria uh, Protect Syrian Heritage Association. Uh, another uh, civil society group was formed in Aleppo during the, you know, 2000. Uh, 12, 2014, during that period, uh, they tried to, to preserve the uh, old city. Um, now, uh, Syrian uh, antiquities, uh, this is, uh, are controlled by uh, the Director General of Antiquities and Museums that is a, uh, operates from Damascus and it's part of the Ministry of Culture. This is where I worked for like 15 years uh, before. Uh, so what happened at the beginning when the war, they started doing things, uh, learning from the Iraq experience and a little bit from also uh, the Lebanese civil war. So first thing, they hid most of the important treasures. I was there for that, um, like from the big size, like Ogaret, Mary, Ebla, uh, in more secure places. And they, there was a rush for digitization and they did some kind of, you know, uh, this is at the Aleppo Museum where they tried to, uh, you know, the gates at least and some of the areas. Uh, some museums were evacuated, sent to Damascus. So that was kind of another thing where like regional museum stuff, if they could, they, they send them to Damascus. They tried to build some, um, uh, you know, new structures in, in museum storages, uh, but very limited. Um, now, international responses led by UNESCO and its sister foundations, uh, they received like, you know, considerable amount of fund from the AU, uh, uh, but then they set up like some kind called uh, uh, Syrian Observatory uh, you know, Syrian destruction or heritage observability says operates from Beirut. Uh, they did spend a lot of money on like workshops and meetings uh, and that kind of thing. And here they are training some of the people from Damascus uh, who did not have really very much uh, access to a lot of the, the things that they, they were destroyed at the time. Uh, they did, uh, of course, sponsor the, the Red List. That's something they do for every country that get, uh, gets into war. Um, archaeologists who worked, Syria had 120 foreign expeditions working at the time of the war happened. Uh, like a huge number of archaeologists working in Syria. They formed some kind of um, organization. And that's mostly like awareness uh, raising, um, Again, not, they, you know, they don't have very much means and funding to do much. Um, another thing, which uh, this is kind of uh, in every tragedy that there are some people who could also benefit from the situation of doing either making money or doing research sometimes. Uh, so this is the thing that became very fashionable to document heritage across the Middle East from Afghanistan to Libya. Uh, these are the most funded projects. Um, these are done by Westerners. Uh, mostly they have some local partners, I would say. It's still on, on kind of some tokenism fashion where you have some people from, from these countries, including Syria, who are not in leadership positions. They just uh, there. Um, so um, I could list the many projects in the discussion if, if or pe people need to know about these projects. Uh, another thing where like technology now is, is celebrated, it's a new way of entering a new era of digitization. And uh, this is the new, I would argue it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a new colonization of heritage where you, know, you don't have actual access to the sites, but you do have a lot of power controlling the you know, digitization and the data. I, uh, this is one of the famous uh, reconstructions of uh, the Palmyra arch that was destroyed by ISIS by the Institute of Digital uh, Archaeology, at, uh, I think Oxford Brooks. Um, 
Uh, so to just politicize, I, I, I leave the, the issue to Professor Mulder to talk about, but a lot of these things, reality of what happens is actually not what we hear about in the news. And that's the typical thing with the Palmyra Museum that got, got destroyed when people at the DGM, because they are work with the Syrian regime, they ma maintained the narrative that they actually protected the museum. It turned out they didn't. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about my own experience with this. Uh, this is why I started here a project uh, with the Pan, uh, Pan Cultural Heritage Center. At the time I was working at the University of Pennsylvania, Smithsonian Institute and uh, lots of partners where we, we created this project safeguarding the heritage of Syria and Iraq project. Our approach was more to like go on the ground, try to support local uh, um, heritage professionals who are trying to do things. Uh, we we try to work in the area where not controlled by the Syrian regime because UNESCO and all the international they still go the Syrian government and and uh, even though there are sanctions against the Syrian regime still uh, nobody uh, like this is allowed because we have to prove that these people not terrorists and not working with the Syrian regime. Uh, we try to do trainings. So training, we did both uh, in Turkey. We, we held training uh, for both Syrians and Iraqis uh, and also uh, online. So this is part of the Smithsonian training of the group that works in Northeast Syria. Um, this is my colleague, uh, Corey Wagner at the time, 2014, where we also helped them buy uh, material that they needed for conservation. At the time they worked at the uh, Mara Museum, and uh, they tried to use like uh, uh, just a simple method from World War II uh, experience, tie back over the mosaics and then sandbags. Uh, we also worked at Ebla, one of the most important sites in Syria that suffered like considerable damage of uh, uh, mostly from looting. And this is some of the consolidation. So this is just like emergency conservation. It's not proper conservation, what we do. L that led us to creating, because all these efforts uh, were kind of done at several institutions and stuff that we created, the Syrian entity led by Syrians, a kind of a platform for preservation of heritage um, and supported uh, by the Smithsonian Institute, National Geographic, uh, the Gerda Henkel Foundation, uh, in Germany. It operates from Germany and works uh, in Northeast Syria most of the time. I apologize for the animation. I couldn't turn them off last minute. Okay, so these are our goals. So this is just more from the experience to um, put Syrians uh, at the decision making about their heritage, also connecting all parties, people who worked in Syria, uh, uh, to work together. This is more about like the voices of the locals about heritage. Uh, you can visit the, uh, the website. So some of the pro project we did at the Idlib city, this is controlled by a more extremist group. Uh, now they call themselves Jabhat uh, uh, Fat Hisham, Al-Qaeda. Uh, this is a museum. The group we work with is the Idlib Antiquity Center Civil so uh, Society group. Uh, together with, uh, you know, CIMAT, CIMAT has, CIMAT, Syrians for Heritage, has a, a like a director of projects that ha actually is on the ground. In Syria, Ammar Kanawi leads our projects there. So uh, this is a museum it was before, and these are the famous uh, 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 tablets from, from Ebla that we know about the, the history of the ancient Near East in the third millennium BC. Uh, this is how it was destroyed uh, during the war. Uh, the storage. So what we did is we tried about 1,500 tablets uh, were looted from the museum. What is remaining, about 500 complete tablets and other fragmentary, we, we actually secured those, you know, created an inventory and then uh, preserve them. Uh, another site I want to show you an, an example where we work. This is the, you know, the uh, dead cities area or the, the um, ancient villages of northern Syria, a world heritage site of seven archaeological parks about 
um, over 700 sites. Uh, I think 42 are registered on the UNESCO uh, website. Um, this is Saint Samian, one of the most important monasteries in the uh, uh, fifth and uh, in the, starting the fourth into the fifth uh, and sixth century AD. Uh, it has, you know, Saint Samian, the stylist, that's the the, uh, the famous monk that lived there. It was uh, destroyed and and by both like Syrian regime, you know, uh, strikes, and also I think the the last one was by Russian uh, airplanes. Uh, by the way, also the the Turkish military destroyed another site where we work at the moment, Ain Dara. I don't have time to show you some of the work we're doing there. I'll, I'll, I'll show because this is completed now. We did uh, intensive documentation of the damage at the site. Uh, and then some intervention that has been like huge. This whole, like the outer wall of the monastery was about to collapse because it got hit. As you can see in the picture, we consulted with the colleagues, historic preservation experts in France and uh, even in Japan about this. And uh, this, this is our team, uh, you know, filling in the gap, but also we, we did a huge consolidation of the entire thing by, you know, um, tons and tons of sa sand that were around to, to support it from the, uh, from the bottom. So this is the last thing. Here is also, a lot of these beautiful Corinthian columns, the monastery are in danger of like fracturing and collapsing. This is some of the emergency conservation that we did. So in short, the experience of CMAT is uh, there's far more damage that we could, we could do or we could help. Uh, looting, uh, now also people, uh, particularly refugees, refugees, uh, um, refugee, um, camps turning into villages, reusing a lot of ancient sites to build with them. Uh, huge problem. We just, we continue with CIMAT as a, a positive example of what you can do uh, to preserve heritage in the most, most difficult circumstances. I wouldn't tell you how tough it is even to channel funds into Syria or material or anything. That is another story. Uh, that is a uh, all I wanted to say today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Akuntar, for that uh, really heartbreaking but very important presentation. Um, Professor Mulder, you have the floor. I was just gonna set my timer so that I don't go over time, but I actually just realized I couldn't do it without an alarm going off. So I'll just rely on you, uh, Hagnar. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to present here today to the Syrian Studies Association and to the Society for Armenian Studies, um, to Hagnar and to Elise and to everybody who worked so hard to organize this today. I think this is a very um, important conversation uh, and I hope that I can contribute uh, a little bit of food for thought with respect to maybe thinking a little bit more now that we've got something, you know, in terms of what's happening on the ground in Armenia and what is still ongoing in Syria, um, how we might think a little bit um, more theoretically maybe about how we can move um, out of a crisis situation and toward a model of recovery and perhaps um, in the process, we think some of the heritage models that have been so durable for the last uh, nearly century now, well, over half a century um, in the aftermath of World War II. So I'm gonna propose a couple of thoughts along those lines um, using the example of Syria as a, a place that has very much, of course, influenced my thinking about um, the role of our ideas about heritage and the way that they, that these ideas end up really controlling what happens um, on the ground, really helping us maybe to navigate toward a new model of more inclusive um, heritage that I think is very, would be very applicable in the case of Armenia. So, um, 
I want to begin in June of 2014, um, although it was hardly reported in the Western media, this is actually the beginning of the ISIS um, sort of uh, movement of cultural cleansing through, um, through the Middle East. Um, beginning in uh, northern Iraq at sites like um, Tel Afor, Mosul, Dermar Elia, um, uh, a monastery outside of Mosul, um, Iraq's oldest Christian monastery. Um, ISIS began a, a series of um, destructive episodes that targeted local communities um, first and foremost. These were devastating experiences for people locally in the region, um, but they were hardly reported, of course, in the Western media. And it wasn't until nearly eight months later, in January and February of 2015, that ISIS got the attention of the world um, when they published that infamous video of themselves destroying sculptures with sledgehammers and uh, in the uh, Mosul Museum in Iraq. So unlike ISIS's previous destructive actions targeted at local communities, this spectacle of heritage violence immediately provoked international shock and outrage. And I think the differing reactions to these two events um, provides a really helpful starting point for thinking about, um, about what our narratives about heritage is and how that actually influences how we respond to these types of crisis events. So today what I'd like to do is very briefly take you through um, a set of uh, thoughts that I've been developing over the last five years or so um, with regard to the idea of what we call often universal heritage, ideas espoused by, ICE, uh, by UNESCO, excuse me. Um, uh, you know, and this is from uh, a couple of years ago, tweeted out by UNESCO's Unite for Heritage at, uh, account. Um, and this is a set of ideas that has been uh, criticized in recent years through the, um, uh, by a group of particularly uh, out of the field of anthropology, um, the work of people like Laura Jane Smith, who have titled this type of model, um, this dominant model, this universalist model of archeological heritage preservation, um, the authorized heritage discourse. And I'll talk a little bit more about what the authorized heritage discourse is, um, but it's essentially a kind of property-based model in which cultural heritage is envisioned as belonging to all mankind, all humankind, all of humanity. And what I'd like to think about a little bit today is the way in which this seemingly, um, you know, beneficial, neutral, um, even, uh, you know, admirable idea has also been an important motivation for the destruction of heritage during wartime. And I think that's exactly what we saw um, in Syria. So maybe an easy way to address this question is through borrowing a question from my colleague, Wendy Shaw, um, how old are antiquities? It might seem like a bit of a strange question, um, but the way to ask this question, you might think to yourself, you know, that the answer, of course, would be dependent on the time and the place and, you know, through the work of archaeologists and other uh, people um, who work on heritage. But of course, really, this idea of, uh, of antiquities is somewhat of a new concept. It's, in fact, grows out of an intellectual and legal construct that the majority of us really rarely question, the idea of global cultural heritage. So I think when we ask ourselves how old are antiquities, we really need to ask, um, you know, how old our contemporary conception of what constitutes an antiquity is, because um, if something is not designated as an antiquity, it doesn't have value within this model um, of universal uh, heritage. So when we ask how old, you know, we might, for example, you know, just to go back to my opening um, sort of assumption that um, it's clear that that the world's differing response to various kinds of cultural heritage destruction, and, and I think this applies to the Armenian uh, case as well, um, the world's response indicates that not all antiquities, not all old, beloved, beautiful things are considered cultural heritage and necessarily worthy of the rallying of the world around their preservation. So um, 
many of you may be familiar with the history of the development of the idea of cultural heritage. It comes in the aftermath of World War II, particularly the Allied bombing campaigns at sites like Dresden. Um, that, of course, led to the adoption of the 1954 Hague Convention and eventually um, uh, to a series of legal statutes adopted and enforced, well, carried out or, or supported by UNESCO, um, including the World Heritage List. Um, a number of those sites, of course, as Salam has indicated are, uh, are in Syria as well. So one way to think about how these different stories played out, of course, is to look at the example of Palmyra, um, which was uh, perhaps the most famous episodes of destruction by ISIS were carried out at the site of Palmyra um, in 2015. Um, Palmyra was an ancient caravan city, uh, you know, um, and its most perhaps famous uh, monument was the Temple of Bel in Palmyra, which was first constructed in 32 CE. Part of the backstory of Palmyra and its many rich and um, uh, kind of magnificent monuments, um, however, is the fact that prior to the 1930s, the site of Palmyra was actually a living heritage site. Um, and I know this is very um, meaningful for Salam because her own mother grew up uh, in Palmyra and, or is it your grandmother, Salam? Uh, both, my mom was very young though. Yeah, um, and what happened in the 1930s, in fact, is that this site of Palmyra, I argue, was actually created as a site of global cultural heritage when over the course of the 19, early 1930s, French archaeologists cleared the site, carried out what I call an act of spatial cleansing, um, cleared the site of its living inhabitants um, and transformed um, the monument at the center, which is what we know today as the Temple of Bell, um, from a mosque into, a, um, into the temple that we all recognize at the, center, uh, at the center of the site today. And just to underscore what a profound transformation this was, um, I argue that the French really actually created a World Heritage Site, created a temple on a site that had in fact been occupied um, for a very, very long time by local Muslims and was certainly as valuable to them. Um, so just to give a little kind of quick run through of the history of this site, it was a Roman era temple for 240 years, a Christian church for 330 years, and it had served as a mosque for over 1300 years. So the idea that we think of this um, uh, as a Roman era temple, in fact, is really largely a construction of that cleansing of the site and its re-inauguration as, as a world heritage site. So we might ask the question of what else could it be if not a, a global world heritage site? Um, and the example that I think really is most helpful in thinking through what else it might have been is to think through the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus as a kind of counterexample, as a kind of living site of heritage that, um, that certainly has a, a very similar, much older history. The Umayyad Mosque in Damascus was originally a, Ro a Roman temple um, to the god Jupiter, one of the largest Roman temples um, in, the middle, in the Roman world, in fact. Um, and it was this interior cella of the temple that was later transformed um, into the mosque that we know today. So it's a case of ongoing adaptive use over many, many centuries, precise parallel, in fact, for what happened at Palmyra. The only difference is that at, in Damascus, the site was allowed to continue being used as a mosque and was not, you know, sort of um, excised of its later history and transformed back to a, spe a specific moment in time that was deemed important by archaeologists, which is what happened at Palmyra. So briefly, I know, I don't know where I am on the time frame, but I think I'm already going about a bit too long. Seven minutes is hard. Uh, so if you, if you could wrap up, Stephanie. I'll wrap up. Thank so, you. Um, just quickly to come back to this question of the authorized heritage discourse, which um, um, has been very strongly challenged by many different entities in the Syrian con Syria conflict, and then also by other militant organizations, for example, um, here at Timbuktu um, in Mali, um, which took direct uh, aim at this idea of, of world heritage. 
Um, so this idea of uh, the authorized heritage discourse, I think we could think through some of the damage that it has done because the ways in which it denudes local sites of local engagement and participation to really kind of vivid examples of this, transforming them into kind of what we call sites of spatial cleansing, where they are no longer relevant to local people. They're no longer, um, you know, uh, kind of living sites anymore. They exist mainly for touristic consumption, for outsider consumption, and not for local um, living uh, kind of heritage engagement. And I have a couple of examples of other types of living heritage sites. Um, and of the Borough Charter, which I think is a really great example um, in Australia, whereby local people are given autonomy over the way that cultural heritage is used that we might think through as, as kind of um, alternative models. So I'll just leave you with this image of the Omayyad Mosque, which I think of as a kind of a local living site of heritage that is both an ancient site, but one that is extremely relevant um, for people today. And I'll just stop there. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, um, Professor Mulder and all, all our uh, panelists for, for your insights. So I think we have a little bit of time for um, a Q&A and I believe Bedros is keeping an eye on the questions. Um, yeah. uh, so uh, maybe I'll uh, start the ball rolling by uh, asking maybe all of the panelists who want to intervene to um, to think about a dilemma that we're facing now with the yes, Syria and uh, and uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, but also so many other places um, where um, we're seeing the, the the human rights of a community uh, being trampled, um, and as part of that that process, that sort of repertoire of violence, uh, the destruction of culture, the, the targeting of religious sites and other beloved sites uh, is also part of that. And I'm thinking of places uh, too many, unfortunately, like Yemen and China and Iraq, of course, and, um, um, it, it, and as well as the places that we're thinking about now. So I would like to um, reflect, you did, uh, Stephanie, did uh, the Stephanie's points about the, the critique that the universal heritage model um, has received are so apt. Um, and yet we still are uh, stuck with this model because of the way international law is set up and so on. And one of the issues that we're facing in both cases is what is, what are, what is the range of actions that is possible when a state, um, a sovereign state has control over a territory, even if it is a failed state, state or a rogue state or whatever we want to call it, a state has a lot of power. And when they are unable or unwilling to protect not only communities, but also heritage on their territory, or maybe both unwilling and unable. Uh, and sometimes when the state itself is the perpetrator of the destruction of the community or condones the, the, the destruction, what is the range of action for uh, inside and outside actors? And you know, I, I'll just uh, let you uh, respond to that. Salam, I feel like you are really well equipped to answer that question, having direct experience. Oh, I think the problem of the more universality or like the way like international law acts and how the structure of, um, you know, organizations like UNESCO, uh, how they operate, how they know to operate. Uh, it's not has not proven to be successful at all. I mean, you know, the, the thing the the World War II, we have the basically the monuments men were more effective um, than anything, right? Because there was a kind of a will and um, you know carriage in what they did, and of course UNESCO emerged from that need to protect. But then they went to operate in a more bureaucratic fashion and to me it's like it's time to to critique that and realize that is not working uh, that is not working sites are being destroyed entire thing like it's just uh, if we want to think of like the memory of of sites um, if also the universality of, of meaning uh, or link 
um, alienated uh, sites because they've, they've seen as like uh, Western property um, and, and their protection from the locals. And if you don't, if you cannot create that um, capital, like local capital for sites, they're not going to be protected by, you know, statements from UNESCO shared online. So, thank you. Um, uh, Pedros, are there questions? Yes, um, I will start with the uh, first one uh, to Professor Maranci. Could you please speak to the relationship between UNESCO and Azerbaijan and if it could compromise UNESCO's commitment to protect protecting ethnic Armenian monuments and cultural heritage in Artsakh? And we know that the uh, cooperation is not taking place or there's no cooperation whatsoever yes yeah well that's that's a crucial question right because of unesco's historical relations with azerbaijan as we know from again from investigative reporting so um that the, that the previous um uh, leader of UNESCO was connected to Azerbaijan and that uh, UNESCO said nothing during the destruction of the Jolfa Cemetery. So um, that's very different from, from the situation with Syria where they denounced um, the destruction of antiquities as a war crime, right? So this is, this is a problem. Um, and uh, what will happen now, I don't know. As, as, as you just said, Bedros, um, UNESCO has, has um, asked to monitor the situation in Artsakh and there has been no answer, right? So, um, so I guess we will see. Um, can I take a minute to respond to the previous question as well? Because I wanted to say just with regard to the issue of what we can do in a situation where bodies like UNESCO are maybe less useful. And I just wanted to say that my experiences in Turkey with uh, civil society foundations with Anatolu Kultur um, gave me hope uh, that there were fissures in um, in places and one can enter into relationships with NGOs, with um, with partnering uh, with locals um, in, in Turkey. And um, that was, and I speak in past tense because of course the, the founder of Anatolu Kultur is now in jail, Osman Kavala, but I still have hope that there are ways, small ways to, to connect with individuals um, in Turkey and work together on projects and it's still happening. So um, I, I think, you know, that's, that's one, success story. I mean, I hate to use the word success, but I, I think it is ongoing. And, and so maybe, you know, UNESCO isn't the model, but I mean, World Monuments Fund at the same time is working with uh, Anatolu Kultur and, you know, organizations um, on a local level. So I think there are various scales of um, solutions. And my experience with Turkey was, was positive in that respect. And I think it will continue. I mean, despite everything that's happening now, I, I'm not giving up hope on that. So I just wanted to, to add that. Thank you very much. Uh, a question to uh, Professor Alcuntar uh, from Lisa Manoyan. She wants to know uh, uh, Ebla's artifacts as to where they were transferred. Yeah, they were not transferred anywhere. They were, um, you know, they are in the antiquities market right now. They haven't appeared in the market. They must be with some dealers. Uh, so uh, those that are initially were in the Idlib Museum, we have stuff uh, in Damascus that are still safe. I'm not sure, I think I read your text about the, uh, the uh, Arata tablets in particular. It's very hard to know which tablets uh, are lost and we have a list um, but then that will have to go to uh, probably Alfonso Archie is the most uh, notable, uh, you know, person who worked on the assemblage. So he would, he he might know uh, if if the the exact these exact tablets are missing or not. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, 
Can I can I jump in just to respond further to this? Because this raises the very important issue of looting and trafficked artifacts that end on the gray and black markets. And um, I think uh, Stephanie has things to say about that that I want to hear. But I, I just want to point out that we, the United States, are very much involved in this because the United States is a major destination uh, for looted artifacts that go through various stages of laundering and they appear um, and some uh, U.S. institutions have purchased uh, artifacts uh, looted from war zones, Syria, Iraq, etc. Sometimes it's very difficult to trace exactly where the artifact has come from. So the efforts of uh, Professor Alcantar and her colleagues in this effort of documentation is so incredibly crucial because if you don't have documentation, then you don't know that which artifacts are missing. And when something appears in your neighborhood museum, um, then you, to trace them to um, their place of origin, you need that kind of documentation. So it's extremely important to have, it's part of human rights work uh, related to cultural heritage to do that, that kind of deep archival work that often doesn't, you know, it's not seen as heroic or glamorous. It's not what Indiana Jones does, but it's really the most important thing that um, people can do who care about that. And I also want to point out uh, in terms of uh, enforcement, uh, it is no accident that uh, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office uh, recently uh, created a new unit um, in their office dedicated to art crimes. That's because the U.S. has become such a destination for looted artifacts. And there's some discussion now in California to also uh, create an office like that here because California, too, and LAX and other airports are both destinations for trafficked artifacts and also places of transit. Um, but, uh, Stephanie, I, I do want to uh, have a chance to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, and I, it's very nice, actually, Christina, to hear that you had such a positive experience um, working with, with, it sounds like, some of the smaller, um, more local Turkish organizations um, for the preservation of heritage. And, you know, I mean, I, you're, you're absolutely, I think several of us to, have pointed to the, to the issue of this needing to be a multi-pronged approach, right? Um, and so often it's a top-down approach and local people are kind of brought in in this sort of tokenizing way, but not actually genuinely the architects of various projects. And I think that, that the issue really ultimately comes down to where is the money going, right? So um, as Salam points out, uh, and, you know, and I completely agree with what you're saying, about um, you know that uh, that documentation is a really crucial part of this process, but oftentimes all we do is documentation. There's just endless, endless, endless kind of digital recordings and very expensive. These projects are very, very expensive. They cost a lot of money to do some of these types of digital documentation projects, and that's money that we might ask ourselves: Would that actually be better spent? You know, investing in the type of um, immediate mitigation projects that Salam and her uh, and and CMAT is is doing right. Um, so so a lot of times I feel like those documentation projects make outsiders feel good about themselves that they're you know doing something important when in fact um, that money maybe is not being best spent on kind of endless documentation and recording or expensive digital recreation type projects. Um, so the point is not to necessarily demonize that whole sphere of things because it's crucial to do that type of documentation, but just to be sure that we are using that multi-pronged approach and that some of that money is actually getting on the ground to local people who can do immediate kinds of intervention that I think are really ultimately what often saves many, uh, many sites. To come back to the question of, uh, of looting and, and the antiquities market too, that's another really, when we're thinking about different prongs, so from the legal point of view, you know, so the most recent um, uh, cultural property agreement, the memorandum of, a, memorandum of understanding signed between Turkey and the United States, um, which prohibits the, uh, the importation of cultural property from Turkey, that I think is a kind of, you know, intervention from the legal side that makes an important um, contribution. So there's no one size fits all solution there, but there needs to be, I think, a real look at where the money goes and who is benefiting from that. 
Thank you. Another question is from Michael Ernest uh, for uh, Dr. Maransi. Have you there been any attempts to approach the Christian communities in Azerbaijan, such as the Russian or the Udi, about quote unquote keeping a nine on on uh, on sites of Armenian cultural heritage in Nagorno Karabakh and the surrounding areas? What was the first part of the question? I didn't hear. What was the sort of verb? Have there been any attempts to approach the Christian communities in Azerbaijan, such as the Russians or the Udi, about keeping an eye on the? I, I'm not sure. I've heard. I feel like I've heard little bits, but nothing conclusive. Hetnar, do you, do you know of anything like that? Um, yes. Um, the um, uh, how can you say this very in a very brief way. Um, the the, uh, the minority communities in uh, Azerbaijan are um, um, I'm I'm not sure I could call them completely free of their movements. They are very closely connected and in fact manipulated by gov the government. It is uh, we we're used to working in Turkey. Azerbaijan is a very different space. Um, it's one of the most unfree um, states. I wish it were otherwise, I really do, because I, you know, I think we would like to begin uh, processes of uh, engagement, but it's been very, very difficult. Um, and um, there, um, the Udi community in particular seems to be both small in number and very closely associated with and aided by uh, government entities and the Heydar Aliyev Foundation, for example. So um, it, there, there's a lot of questions. Um, however, I do believe that um, Catholic Kosovo Armenians based in Echmiadzin has engaged in a number of diplomatic activities. Um, the Catholicos did visit Azerbaijan with Patriarch Kirill of Russia several years ago uh, and met with the Sheikh al-Islam of Azerbaijan. And it was that um, visit was deemed one of the few successful diplomatic um, episodes in the 30 years between the First and Second Karabakh Wars. So many of us are hoping that, again, the multi-pronged approach that Stephanie mentioned, that uh, religious leaders could have a positive role to play. But whether religious leaders in Azerbaijan have any freedom of movement um, is a question. And do they in fact, have a, a, a different vision for Karabakh that, that is different from that of the uh, of the, uh, President Aliyev. Uh, I don't know that. Thank you for that question. Okay, another question by Lindsay, Lindsay Cook uh, to Professor Al-Kantar. You have already spoken to this question a bit, but could you say a bit more about how exactly you define the quote-unquote new colonization of heritage? Do you see this as a continuation of the colonial practice of spatial cleansing uh, that Professor Mulder described in her talk? Well, I mean, archaeology in the Middle East is dominated by Westerners, uh, it's been since the 19th century. Um, but then when the wars happen and, and they couldn't access archaeological sites, so the, the, the thing was becoming access. So what they have access to is the technology that people in the Southern globe, they don't necessarily have. Um, so that is kind of like a new era where the digitization and documentation of heritage to become virtually available to Westerners who kind of access it on the ground, that became more important. So here the stakeholders is more Western research and Western society than these actual sites. Uh, so this is the, the thing. Um, the now questions actually about uh, data and countries now, especially I, I heard in Africa, it's, it's uh, um, Algeria in particular now with whatever like, whatever, even if, if they're not coming on the ground, whatever study done like in Algeria, for example, and other African countries, they uh, that data has to come to the to the state there. Uh, so this is a new thing. It has to be organized. It's like a cyber law. They, they need to to be some like uh, for actually that to make it available also for on the ground and the future reconstruction, um, uh, preservation, all of that. So yeah. Uh, we ask another couple of questions and then we'll end this. Uh, one by Girard Christinian. Uh, 
Christianian, sorry. How does the recently signed uh, memorandum of understanding between the US and Turkey impact the indirect relabeling of Armenian cultural property as Turkish? And as we know, uh, Armenians were not happy about this memorium, uh, memorandum of understanding because of this uh, specific reason. If anyone wants to chip in, please go ahead. Um, I'll jump in about the MOU. Um, I refer you to an article in the art newspaper by Ayla Jean Yakli that uh, covered some of the critiques of this uh, memorandum. Um, it, it, uh, there's a lot of memorandums like this that are signed. It's a bilateral agreement between the United States and another country that aims at implementing uh, some of the international norms uh, related to looting and tra trafficking of artifacts um, and so on. And um, the United States also has a similar MOU with uh, Syria, the Syrian Arab Republic. So um, I, I'm one of the critics of this, so, or I have questions about this MOU, let's just put it that way. And I have the same questions of the MOU with Turkey as I do with the MOU with Syria. Um, if this is uh, about you know, uh, protecting antiquities from being trafficked or uh, returning trafficked antiquities um, or focusing on preventing the looting of archeological sites, all those are, are very important goals and laudable goals. Um, however, you, when we're dealing with a, a country that a state that and state organizations that have themselves been implicated with not caring for or in fact um, harming cultural heritage sites, then you know we have to ask the question of what what is going on, um, and um, you know uh, there's a, there's a whole range of. Uh, uh, obligations that states undertake under these MOUs and under international norms that have to do with the protection of cultural heritage on their territory in a universal way, it, with justice, with transparency. And so uh, these agreements also have to mean that the states like Syria, like Turkey, um, have to live up to um, uh, their obligations. Thank you. And the last question by Aslihan Gunhan. Uh, uh, it's to the panel in general. Uh, he asked, I wonder if alternative modes of group of solidarity other than UNESCO are possible. Art and architectural history has become more and more intertwined with fieldwork on site research and transforms into a form of quote unquote truth telling. And I think scholars of many disciplines may benefit from solidarity acts, shared information and crowdsourced platforms. Uh, I just wanna also say something that Anadolu Kultur also supported CIMAT, right? And actually Osman Kavala, who is the one, the, the first sponsor of us, we were supposed to be based in Istanbul, not in Berlin, but because of his arrest, we changed plan. So Anadolu Kultur was like amazing example of helping uh, different fronts and different um, ethnic heritage, so to speak. Uh, and it is disappointing, actually. There's a lot of solidarity with Osman. I would say uh, I haven't had, you know, much kind of, what do you call it, like rallying within the heritage community. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it, it really, you know, breaks my heart. And for that reason, I'm, you know, it's kind of, um, I know, Christina, you talked, you're still hopeful. I kind of got a little bit, um, a little bit, you know, put off from working in Turkey actually after this experience, so. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Professor Samerjan is going to make the concluding remarks. Thanks, thank you all for attending today's meeting and uh, Professor Samerjan, the floor is yours. I just wanted to bring this to a close by thanking this impressive panel of scholars. Um, they're extending their academic work into activism out of necessity. And I'm in awe as they maintain their scholarly agendas. We're working with grassroots heritage defenders and international bodies um, doing their best to protect heritage and um, working as public historians um, and public intellectuals to inform the world about what is happening and the kinds of debates we should be having uh, with a critical eye to sites of spatial cleansing and the problems of the concept, that large concept of global heritage. 
We also have um, with the Armenian case, in Artsakh, an urgency um, to even document heritage with 3D scanning um, in archival investigations under conditions of military occupation and evolving ceasefire lines that seem to be moving uh, from week to week. Um, we hope that this panel brought you some insights into some of the connections between these two conflict zones that are rarely in conversation with one another, where both humans and heritage lie in harm's way. And I want to thank you again, panelists, for offering your insights and educating us, and thank the attendees for coming out this Saturday morning in our first ever collaborative.